Welcome to the Barricade Inn, a squatted social centre right in the heart of Dublin on Parnell Street. We're going to talk to some of the people living and helping to run the space. Okay, we're in the uh, Barricade Inn on Parnell Street, which is a squatted building, kind of a social centre, some people living here as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the building came back into use and some of the things that are happening in here today. So maybe if we start off with uh, how long have, how long has this building been occupied for? Oh, well, let's start with the more obvious question. Do you know how long it was empty for before people moved in? Yeah, uh, the building was empty for roughly 13 years, I think. Uh, 12 or 13 years. Um, I was, before there had been various uses of the building, like it had been a s small hotel and also a betting shop had run in the building. But for a long time, it had been like, in like, it wasn't in consistent use for even previous than thirteen years, as far as we're aware at this stage. But completely empty for thirteen years. Uh, yeah. So for people vaguely familiar with Dublin, but maybe don't know the location, it's more or less across the road from the Hop House and right next door to Fibber McGee's and fifty meters from the Parnell Monument. So it's about as central as you could really get without uh, occupying a building on O'Connell Street. Um, so it's kind of remarkable in itself, it's been empty that long. It still says Neary's Hotel, I think, downstairs somewhere, uh, yeah, which um, is one of the uses. It, it was it was Neary's Hotel for quite a long period. I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who've actually stayed here and went to parties and that here. Uh, there's an interesting history to the building as well. Uh, like, but, you know, but back in the, uh, before the 1916 rising, there was volunteers who stayed here. Uh, and allegedly uh, Tom Clark's t uh, tobacco shop was just down the road and he came down to the building and said oh, basically lads get out you're near me it's a, it's a dangerous dangerous for security and they had to get all their guns and stuff out of here and do a runner there's also uh, several autobiographies of people who fought in the Tan War and in the 1916 Rising who stayed here beforehand and during the Tan War and used the building basically as a, a discreet safe house and so there's an interesting history to it Okay, that's actually quite a back history. Um, so when people initially entered the building, what sort of state was it in? It was like a bomb site. It was an absolute wreck. Um, in the front cafe area, there was um, about five foot of rubble, concrete rubble in bags and bins. And um, basically every room was full of between 10 to 15 needles and general rubbish and boards over every the windows. It was not habitable. It was... There was dead pigeons everywhere. There was also, um, in one of the rooms, there had been uh, an altered roof um, created to funnel water from a leak in the roof, which is quite clearly created by uh, someone who wanted to wreck the building. The water was been funneled towards the stairways and into the wooden parts of the building to destroy it as it is a protected building. And we, we have talked to individuals who have experience with this sort of um, this sort of thing and it's, it's basically a tactic to destroy a building, a protected building so it can be knocked down and you know apartments built in this space because they wouldn't get approval from the government unless the building was dangerous. So, yeah. Ah right, so that also explains perhaps why, why it was left empty so yeah. long. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, so the initial thing people obviously did was have to clear up all that mess, that must have been quite a lot of work. Yeah, it was about two and a half months of constant work of like, I'd say a core team of like 15 volunteers and then various people, maybe not 25 people coming and going like electrical stuff and just having out and out there and bringing materials down. There's also obviously we had to fix the leaks in the roof and several like, replaced one roof at the back and uh, cut off the leak that was destroying the building basically. It was, uh, yeah, we didn't realise it at the time but it was a huge amount of work. Yeah. Um, so let, let's talk about the current shape of the, the buildings that now stand. It's kind of in two halves. The, the half we're in at the moment, uh, which is the ground floor and the first floor, it's various <laughs> rooms that are used for kind of public or social centre yeah. purposes. Do you want to describe what those rooms are to me? Yeah, um, so on the ground floor when you come in, we've got the cafe area and our cafe is currently open two days a week on Saturdays and on Mondays, uh, it's 1 till 5 on Saturdays and 5 till 9 on Mondays. Then um, we've got the info shop in the library, um, which is home to the Lost Scene Archive, and as well, we've got a lot of our own radical literature and zines. Um, we've also got a big bike workshop at the back of the building and um, a big hall room that we call the Disco Disco Room that we have gigs and events on. Um, 
Also, there's capoeira and dancing and MMA, I think I had MMA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, then upstairs on the second or on the fourth, first floor, we've got the meeting room. Um, we've got the computer room, which has computers that anyone can come in and use the internet. Um, we've got a screen printing and art and craft room. We've got the ballroom, which we have a projector set up to do film screenings, and we've got the free shop. Um, then the top two floors above that are the residence area. Yeah, so as well as uh, providing all those facilities, which are all done freely, like there's no charge for people people putting things on, uh, there's also, what, half a dozen people living here? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's about, it, it varies, but like at least 10 re permanent residents at any one time, but there's also guest rooms for people travelling, uh, people who, evicted squatters who need a place to stay and store their stuff. And um, yeah, any, busy if, if you need somewhere to stay, we put people up. It, it, at different times during the summertime, there could have been 30 guests, including the residents staying in the building. And these are people who have nowhere else to go. Um, so one of the things you mentioned in there was people who'd been evicted from other occupied yeah. buildings. I mean, there's been a, a, a wave of occupations and evictions over the summer. Um, Probably Grange Goldman is the one that people would know about because it got lots of publicity. But uh, so we've been covering in solidarity times. There's actually been been a whole string of those. Um, and one of the things that that strikes you is how many of these buildings are quite close to each other. Like it's quite a small area. So uh, you know, there's this claim that the housing shortage we have is due to a lack of buildings and the government is saying oh we have to start giving out more grants to developers and making it easier for them to invest but the reality we've seen even in central dublin is that there's loads of places that are not only empty but like here have been deliberately left empty um, and uh, when people do occupy those to to sort out their own housing needs uh, the response are, is court injunctions eviction orders and the cops knocking down the door at 9 a.m uh, yeah, that's I've been involved in several spots now, including Queen's Corner where evictions have occurred, and like it's just like I think the statistics speak for themselves. It's, I think three hundred thousand empty buildings in Ireland. Like if you just walk around Dublin and look around you, like there's empty buildings left, right, and centre, and like most like uh, volunteers and you know community workers and friends and family, you know, will come together, and there's been proven with things like the Bolt Hostel, the Queen's Corner, and this place and other squats around Dublin, people can do it themselves and pull together and do it themselves. It's just the state won't allow it and that's as simple as that. It's an infringement on their, they see it as a threat to their complete dominance and capitalist property rights and they're putting the, 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 the rights of developers and billionaires and, and banks ahead of the needs of families and homeless people throughout the country and the world. Um. So, I mean, what one of the, what was I going to say, one of the interesting things in terms of people working together and supporting each other in terms of the various occupations and ev evictions that have gone on, but there was also some involvement in terms of the boat, which was the attempt to provide emergency accommodation for homeless families. Uh, that's probably half a kilometre from here or so as well. Uh, yeah, the, the, basically the bolt actually um, originated, like the ideas of, of doing the bolt hostel uh, came from the barricade and the meetings. To organise that there came from the were held in the barricade and the people who were heavily involved in that there came from the barricade and uh, again it was the state put pressure on it on the activists involved like uh, and it, w it was shut down eventually but it does show that we can like um, we can't do these projects together without the need of the state like uh, I was also involved in that project and we had trace people from all across uh, Dublin and supplies and spare beds and everything coming like been donated towards towards us and towards the hostel to put people up who were in need and again the state came in and said it was unacceptable because you know it's not good enough for them. Um, if you were to make a guess how many people do you think have been in the building uh, since it reopens like how many people will have been in and out of this space? Staying or visiting? Just like at an event maybe going to a gig or? Well I remember the first gigs not here there must have been a, like just in the, in the very first night of opening there must have been at least 250 people here at that um, and so the, easily thousands of people have come through this building.
Yeah, and I know like from trying to organize various things in the, the city for a long time, one of the difficulties you always face, particularly if you want to do it centrally, is that you can't really organize something without shelling out large amounts of money for room hire and things like that. Yeah. So this sort of space opens up a whole load of possibilities of things that are things people want to do, but they're not necessarily things that are commercially viable, as they put it. Uh, or even if they were, they're not necessarily things that you'd want to see people turning into a profit-making thing. And that has quite a corrupting effect on culture in general. Yeah, and in general, we, we've attempted to provide uh, space, like completely free, if people wish to donate and appreciate the space and then that's up to themselves. But like again, we are doing our best to provide spaces for like things like experimental music, uh, meeting spaces for housing groups, activist groups, community groups, uh, cost price printing and computer access and internet access for activists or anyone who needs it um, at all. And as long as they're in line with the general principles uh, of the space, we are more than willing to help people out. Um, we've hosted, uh, there's meant to be a Kurdish Solidarity Day been held here in the future and all of it has been done on a volunteer basis by the people working here. The gigs are run on a volunteer basis. Uh, if people wish to donate, that's great, because we it does take money to buy food for the kitchen, to buy light bulbs, you know, buy basics and stuff like that there. But none of that money goes towards any individual, even in the residence area. There's not so much as toilet paper bought for the residence area out of that money. Uh, well, actually, that that's, you mentioned there were, what, normally about 10 permanent residents, but in fact, there's also other people who'd be coming here regularly to help organise things. So, you know, the kind of collective group of people who are involved in running the space would be considerably bigger than that in that sense, yeah? Yeah, there's roughly 25 to 30 people in the overall collective. The collective's run along um, kind of each area or interest area in the, in the social centre is run by an autonomous collective within itself. So like the vegan cafe has the collective, the info shop has collective, the events group has collective, the bike workshop has collective and so on and so forth. And each of them groups come together once a month to discuss and anything relevant that may affect each other area of the social centre and to generally coordinate things and, and, and just to provide feedback and let everyone know exactly what's going on and if anything will affect them. And that's how the space is run. And it's all done in consensus decision making and in a democratic manner. And, um, so, I mean, in terms of, there's a lot of work going into this place, there's also a lot of people involved and a lot more people coming in and using it. Uh, I mean, what's the sort of overall purpose or vision behind it? What, why are you doing it? Um, obviously that varies from individual to individual, but like in general trends, it is to provide a space and kind of hub for people to organise and come together and to meet each other and also to obviously spread an anti-capitalist critique of society and what, all that goes with that. And, but not, not to force our views on anyone, just to engage with people and let people know there is an alternative to the way a capitalist system is organised and the state system is organised. So it's like there's various reasons, but like all these come together into like engagement and providing a space for community and groups and also, also obviously for uh, anarchists and squatters to meet up and, and to support each other and be there for each other.